Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nidoy. Uh, our colleagues, uh, you're most welcome. Again, we apologize on behalf of the organizing team for, for the delay and the glitch, uh, but uh, we appreciate uh, your patience and the resilience. I will uh, uh, proceed uh, as planned. Uh, we have uh, a number of, uh, of uh, our panelists uh, 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 that I'm going to introduce. In the interest of time, I'll introduce uh, 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 one at a time as, as they speak. Uh, but before we do that, uh, our session is about uh, research capacity strengthening in the era of universal health coverage and uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, before I forget, uh, my name is Fred Kitutu. I'm a lecturer at Macquarie University, a pharmacist, uh, uh, and also acting dean of the School of Health Sciences. Uh, I, I would say I'm in my mid a scholar of, of research capacity strengthening and, and, and also uh, a beneficiary of uh, efforts by TDR. This session uh, was put together uh, by the WHO TDR, and uh, we'll hear a, a bit more about it from uh, Dr. Edward Imberu. It brings together researchers from different regions and countries in the Sub-Saharan Africa uh, who is, uh, have been supported by the different initiatives of TDR. And uh, the purpose is to share diverse experiences of how capacity strengthening and career development in research on infectious diseases of poverty uh, can happen. The aim is to provide encouragement uh, to those who are in this, uh, on this journey through awareness of opportunities through networking and for researchers to pursue careers in infectious diseases of poverty. A strengthening capacity for this research will help narrow the gaps and contribute towards achievement of universal health coverage and uh, the sustainable development goal. This, can, this session cannot come sooner given what we've experienced with uh, uh, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and the fact that uh, many countries and actors have had to look uh, indoors uh, inside within countries uh, for solutions. So with that, I will uh, I'll move on to, to invite uh, 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 my co-chair uh, to say a few, a few words before we go on to the first uh, uh, session. Uh, Dr. Brendo Kech, please, uh, the floor is yours. Greetings, everybody. It's great to have you on the session and apologies for the delay. We are so glad to have you. Indeed, training and capacity strengthening are really key. And we are grateful that WHO thought of this very important session. And um, it's a pleasure really for us to chair this session and we look forward to great discussions. Feel free to engage. My name is Brenda Okech. I'm the director at UVRIAVI. And as the chair said, I'm one of actually the beneficiaries and I will wear a second hat and also give a, a presentation on behalf of Wilfred Mutombo, who is in the field, but has shared his presentation. So it's a pleasure and I look forward to worthwhile engagements. Welcome everyone. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kitch, for those kind remarks. Uh, I'm going to reiterate, we have uh, uh, a panel of uh, uh, Dr. Brendo Kitch, uh, uh, Dr. Teresa Eduardo, uh, Dr. Edward Imberu, and, uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Jerry uh, Gua. Yeah, Dr. Jerry, uh, I hope I've not missed uh, anyone else. Uh, so all our speakers uh, did not make it. Uh, for purposes of moving forward, the Teresa was the first to join me. I'll therefore uh, invite uh, Teresa to, to go first. Uh, uh, Dr. Teresa Eduardo Machai serves as the head of the training unit in Manhika Health, Health Research in Mozambique, uh, a satellite regional training center supported by ITDR. Her topic of presentation today is organizational challenges for the development and dissemination of training tools for implementation research. Uh, Dr. Teresa, uh, like they say in Mozambique, obrigado. Thank you for coming. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, please uh, 
I'll take us through your presentation. Dr. Teresa, Eduardo, please unmute, unmute yourself in case you're speaking. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank good you morning. for this opportunity. May I start sharing the slide? Uh, please go ahead. Yes, okay, thank you. Dr. Teresa, is, is everything okay? Can you see my screen? Uh, yes, please. Yes, please. You can uh, uh, change it to a uh, screen. Uh, slide. Uh, excellent. I just want to hide this. Okay. Okay, thank you so much once again. Uh, I will be, uh, as said in the beginning, I work as a as a, a training director at Manisa Health Research Center. I am in charge of all research training activities. So I will be talking about organizational challenge for the development and dissemination of training tools for implementation research. So those are the contents of my presentation. I'm gonna give a brief general overview and concepts, then collaboration, giving an information regarding the research training programs at Manisa Health Research Center, where I'm working and share some challenges. So in terms of uh, general overview and concept, universal health coverage uh, means that all people have access to the health service they need where and where they need them. It means that uh, uh, it includes the range of essentials, health promotion, prevention, treatment, rehabilitation, and also to deliver this service requires adequate and competent health and care workers with optimal skills for that. And currently at least half of the people in the world do not receive the health service they need. The universal health coverage strategies enable everyone to access the service that address the most significant causes of diseases and death that ensure that the quality of those services is good enough to improve the health of the people who receive them. And achieving universal health coverage is one of the targets the nations of the world set when adopting the sustainable development goals in 2015. It was reaffirmed this commitment during the United Nations General Assembly higher level meeting in 2019. So countries that progress towards universal health coverage, they will make progress towards this and good health allows children, everyone and people to reduce the poverty and have the well-being and also be able to develop for the economic of the countries. Having said that, regarding the sustainable development goals, I would like to highlight that those at the collection of 17 intelligent global goals. Those one which was set up by United Nations General Assembly in 2015, and they are intended to be achieved by the year 2030. They included in the United Nations resolution called. So here we can see the sustainable development goals. They are 17. I will be focused on the third one. So uh, the health, the good health and well-being is one of the 17 sustainable development goals to ensure health lives and promote well-being for all at all ages, and also aims to achieve universal health coverage. The purpose of this is to end preventable death 
and newborns, infants, and children under five years in, in epidemics. So why sustainable development goals is so important? The good health is essential for development. Sustainable development and the 2030 agenda. As we know, approximately, the co-host has asked you to start your video. So therefore, to achieve the sustainable target by universal garbage, at least 1 billion more people, we need to have access to the essential health service. As mentioned before, the sustainable development goal number three, expire to ensure health and well-being for all, including a bold commitment to end epidemics like AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, and other communicable disease by 2030. So, and it also aims to achieve universal health coverage and provide access safe and effective medicine and vaccine for all. Consider the global health pandemic of COVID, there is a need to give significant attention towards the realization of good health and well being. So, uh, on the sustainable development goal number three, it's supposed that by the end of 2030, we reduce the overall maternity mortality rate to less than seven deaths per 100,000 life births and preventable deaths of newborns and children under five years and epidemics such as AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, and other neglected tropical diseases, as well as reduce premature mortality from non-communicable disease. It's also important to highlight that by 2030, it's supposed to reduce the premature mortality from non-communicable disease, ensure universal access to sexual and reproductive health, as well as achieve universal health coverage, including financial risk protection, access to quality essential health service too access the safe, effective quality. How can countries make progress toward universal health coverage? Many countries are already making progress toward this, although everywhere the COVID-19 pandemic impacted the availability of health system to provide and health service. This meeting was supposed to take place last year, but due to this pandemic, it was postponed. And today we are having the meeting uh, online and it's not the same as having this face-to-face. -face. All the countries can take action to move more rapidly towards universal health coverage. So what I would like here to bring for this discussion is I'm going to talk now to show the linkage between universal health coverage, sustainable development goals and training activities that has been taken into consideration. So there are some challenges that institutions are facing. Most of the collaborations are based on North and South collaboration and North and South and North. Why this happened? This is an interesting question. So there is a lack of confidence on African institutions. There are several uh, issues that mention that this of lack of confidence, most of the African institutions, they have poor management capacity. Some of them, they have low quality data when it's time to report or even to prepare an article. The data collected is not that much with good quality. And also this lack of confidence really on the fact that the low reporting capacity and deliver of the services or product that those institutions are supposed to do. So I would like to share what is going on on Manisa Health Research Center, Mozambique, in terms of human capacity. The consolidation and future sustainability of the center is to have people able to lead and manage research center. Mozambique as a country needs this type of skills development for its own progress, especially on health and biomedical research area. Since the creation of the Manisa Health Research Center, training has been as one of the strategic areas. The partnership with training institution has been key to strengthening the research and technical capacity of the country. At the center, we do have training as part of research, and we also have training with collaboration and partnership with other training institutions. As you can see, in training as part of the research, we do have research training, postgraduate training, internship, training of technical, and sometimes workshops and seminars where people have the opportunity to share, to learn about the work that has been conducted within the country and outside with other institutions. 
we do have collaboration also with partnership with other training institutions that are implemented with us the activities that we are taking into consideration. So this training fellowship program, it's one of the uh, oldest program that we do have. This training lasts for at least four to seven years because for this training program, the people need at least two to three years being at the center, learn by doing. The person is involved in a research project where this paper person is going to learn by doing, has opportunity to participate in seminars, in journal clubs, and also conferences at the national or international level. So after two years or three years of working experience, so the person has the experience to go for master and PhD. And the master and PhD, they can last for one to two years. The master for, I'm sorry, the master can last for two years and the PhD, it can last for two to four years. It depends where the person is going to take the PhD and then the postgraduate training. So having said that, from now, for this moment, we have almost 32 people that are doing their training research training with us here at Manisa Health Research Center. 16 of them are doing master PhD and 16 are doing master. For those PhD, 10 are national people and six, they come from other countries. And for the master, 16 of them, they are local from here. Here, I'm just bringing some of the courses that people are taking, for example, the master and PhD program. As you can see, the masters, most of the masters that people have been uh, participated, a master's on medical microbiology, science of medicine, clinical research, infectious disease, public health, bioinformatics, and social anthropologists. And the PhD is mainly people, they are going for public health, international health, epidemiology, medicine and transnational health, biomedical science and medicine. And some of those areas in some research institutes is not because of the areas that are going to answer, for example, for the sustainable development goal or for the universal health coverage. Those are the areas that sometimes they come from the strategic plan of the institution or because, for example, the people that are leading those institutions don't think that those are the areas that the institution needs those people to have the capacity in order to conduct the research. So these figures here is just to show you how many people, for instance, in the last five years they have been doing there, for example, for the masters. As you can see, most of the people, they are going for the mass on clinical research. And then we have people doing masters on infectious disease, public health, and social anthropology. On the PhD, we have more people doing medicine and transnational research. And we do have then later people doing international health, biomedical science, and medicine. So having said that, as we can see here, the objective number three for the sustainable development goal, what is expected that we reduce the overall mortality rate to less than seven deaths and the preventive of deaths, reduce the premature mortality from non-communicable diseases, ensure universal access to sexual and reproductive health. And having said that, I'm sorry, I think that there is one slide. After this slide, what I would like to mention is that I have, I have shown I have some slides that I can't see, maybe they are hiding. I'm sorry, I will stop sharing and then going again. So you can see, oh, I think that they are hiding and I didn't see this during my presentation. So they can't appear now on this presentation. Just give me one second. I'm so sorry for that. Yes, they were hiding, and I'm so sorry for this. I'm just unhiding the slides because they are. Sorry, one second. Okay. So I will continue from here. So, uh, can you see my screen? Hello? Yeah, yeah, we yes. can see it. 
Thanks. Okay, yes, thank you. I'm please. so sorry. Yeah, I'm yeah, so yeah. sorry for that. Yes, they were hiding and I didn't check before. I'm very sorry for that. I wanted also to add the TDR role. During all those process of training, Manisa Health Research Center consider and still the TDR role on training has been fundamental for us. The TDR, for example, has the regional training center, which is University of Ghana School of Public Health. But for that, the TDR regional training center was supposed to give training for almost all the regions. But in terms of the, for example, the Portuguese speaking African countries, it was then later on contacted and the Manisa Health Research Center presented the strategy to support the regional training center Ghana. So Manisa Health Research Center is the satellite regional training center supported by TDR. So our role was to provide training for Portuguese speaking African countries like Angola, Cape Verde, Guinea-Bissau, San Tome, Principe and Mozambique. So what we have done so far, we have been trained as trained trainers for the good clinical practices and for good clinical laboratory practices. Since 2016, we have been trained in 2016. As you can see, we have been progressing with the GCP and GCP training course. And then in, in 2020, we started giving some training also to some of the Francophone countries. And also in 2021st, we gave training for some of the Anglophone countries. What happened? We have been training to be a satellite training center to help the Portuguese speaking countries in Africa. But due to that capacity building that we have, we were also requested for other consortiums to be able to provide also this kind of training for Francophones and for, for Anglophone countries. So far, we have been training, for example, Palops country, 977 people. For Anglophone country, we started to train them this year. We train already 27 people, and we, we are going also to continue training those people for this year and the next year. And Francophone country, we have trained 84 people last year. So for us, this has been fundamental. We have been learning, exchange experience, and now we are leading this training session and we can provide training for other institutions that are going to conduct clinical trials in their own institution. So having said that and going back to the sustainable development goal, just for you to remember again what I has mentioned, those are the sustainable development goals that we are supposed to achieve. Reduce the overall maternity rate, ensure universal health access and reproductive health, achieve universal, including financial risk, so on, so on. So my question is, will we be able to achieve universal health coverage and sustainable development goals with the training that we are conducted? I'm talking about the research training as I show the areas that people are doing their master, the areas that people are doing their PhD, consider the sustainable development goals. If so, we are working towards to achieve, how are we going to train people for this end? Are we giving the correct training for the people to contribute for the sustainable development goals? How can we be aligned to achieve universal health coverage and also be able to achieve the sustainable development goal by 2030? Other issue that we have been facing is a challenging, for instance, for this, this before. Teresa, Teresa, you have one minute to conclude. Uh, thank you. I'm ending the presentation. Thank you so much. And we're facing, for example, some of the challenge that we're also facing with this kind of training is the language barriers. And also due to the fact that now the training, most of the training are virtual. And it's not easier to make sure that everyone is really following all the training since the beginning until the last minutes. So I'd like to bring to the discussion whether the African institution are really giving the appropriate training in order to achieve the universal health coverage and also the sustainable development goals. Thank you so much for this opportunity and end from here. Uh, yes, I thank you very much, uh, Dr. Teresa. Again, we are going to have uh, about 30 minutes uh, at the end for Q&A. So I request uh, our colleagues and participants, please uh, type your questions in the Q&A or uh, hold them till uh, the time for Q&A. So uh, given uh, that uh, we've, uh, we've, we've lost a bit of time, 
I just want to reiterate uh, that the presenters are uh, please uh, keep within uh, your time. And so far we have uh, 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 three, three presentations to go. Uh, we shall have uh, uh, Dr. Brenda Okech uh, presenting uh, how, and then we shall have uh, Dr. Edward Imberu uh, from TDR uh, giving us the origin of, of, of some of these initiatives that we are sharing today. Then we'll have uh, Dr. Uh, Brenda presenting on behalf of uh, another panelist who is not able to join. And uh, we, uh, given that uh, our end time is meant uh, to be at 1, 1, 1 30, we have very little time. So we'll keep our presentations to between uh, five to eight minutes. Uh, there are, I'll then take this opportunity to invite uh, Dr. Brenda Okech uh, to present uh, her presentation and please uh, let her uh, let her uh, uh, keep within uh, uh, the time. Dr. Brenda, uh, please, the floor is yours. Uh, let me share your slides uh, from here. Thank you very much indeed. And I'm very grateful to have this opportunity to present and I was one of the fellows for the Clinical Research and Development Fellowship. And this was way back in 2007. And I was based at um, GSK in Belgium for one year. And this was under TDR sponsorship. Next slide, please. So this is to acknowledge the funders for the organization where I work for now which is UVRI Ayavi. I'm really privileged that through the connection and training at UVR, UV, at, at TDR, at DSK, in clinical trial development management, I was able to work with different groups working on clinical trials. And after a series of opportunities, it led me to this opportunity at UVRI Ayavi, where I am director of the program. And the mission of this program is really around HIV clinical trial development. And of course, with all the different happenings now, we have also diverged a bit, and we are also looking into other areas, including, um, including COVID. Our vision as an organization is to have a healthy and productive world without HIV. Next slide, please. That's a, a picture of our organization. So we work in these main thematic areas. Clinical trials is the main stay. It's the central department that we have here. And we have had the opportunity to work on phase one trials, phase two trials, and now we are doing a phase three. So we are happy about the development over the years. We also do epidemiological research in key areas, HIV, TB, malaria, and hepatitis. We have a social sciences department, basic research, as well as advocacy and community engagement. Next slide, please. Of course, one of the key advantages of the TDR training was also connection with various other collaborators. And this has been very key. Of course, as an institution, we have local collaborators, including Ministry of Health, Mild May Uganda, the Government Institute, Uganda Virus Research Institute, and we also have international ones. And many of these are through connections with collaborators outside the country. And these have been really key in terms of training because for example, we have staff who are, in, who are working with these collaborators either on their PhDs or on their masters. Next slide, please. So the institution has a well-developed clinical trials department. As I mentioned, we are able to carry out trials from phase one right up to phase three. And so far we've carried out seven HIV vaccine trials. Our staff are well-trained in GCP, GCLP, HSP, 
And actually, we have also gone ahead to provide this service or this training to other institutions. And Teresa, who spoke earlier, is one of the institutions, Manisa, is where we were able to go and also provide some training. But also locally, we have provided this training to Mild May. So we are very proud of that, of passing on the skills that we've learned to others who are also doing clinical trials. And of course, all these trials have to be compliant with all the local ethical and regulatory standards. Next slide, please. We have a, a well-developed lab that is able to meet all the local and international standards. We are fully accredited. And we also are enrolled into several quality management programs. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yes, and also as a lab, we are able to carry out many tests, several of them linked directly to clinical trials. So we are able to assess the safety of participants as they get the before they receive product as well as during the course of the trial and also after. So for some of the earlier clinical trials, we still continue to follow up those participants over the years just to be sure that they remain safe and they remain okay. Um, the next thing is immunology, which you could say is partly for research, but also to be able to tell that the vaccines that we've given are Hello, Dr. Brenda. And Dr. Brenda, we can't hear you. Uh, it seems we've, we've lost uh, Dr. Brenda. Yeah, let's give her a minute uh, to join. As uh, as uh, Dr. Edward Imberu uh, prepares to uh, to give us his remarks. Uh, Uh, we've, we've lost Dr. Brenda. Hopefully she will join and I uh, will give her a chance to, to summarize. Uh, for now, uh, I think we, uh, we, 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 we see uh, what GDR has been able to achieve uh, as, as, as uh, the two presenters have, have mentioned. And now I think uh, it's a good time to, to hear from uh, Dr. Edward Imberu, who is part of, uh, of the team at uh, WHO TDR uh, that uh, 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 thinks through these, these initiatives and uh, uh, goes ahead to implement them. Uh, Dr. Edward, are you ready to, to give us your remarks? I'll stop sharing. And when uh, Dr. Brenda comes back, we shall, we shall give her a chance to conclude. Uh, you have uh, eight minutes, uh, Dr. Edward. I uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Freddie. I think, can you hear me? Yes, please, loud and clear. Thank you. I think I will, I will take less than that because I'm not going to give any presentation. I'm just going to highlight some of the aspects that we consider pertinent to this kind of activities and so and uh, the way forward. I think one thing that we need to talk about is to mention that this research capacity strengthening needs to be structured a structured research capacity strengthening at the local level, be it uh, uh, at the national level or a district level, of course, let's, let's focus on the national level. There ought to be a structured research capacity strengthening that is locally supported and especially so with a research agenda that it's been you know, taken through the, the, the national uh, processes. 
And therefore, when you have a research agenda, then you have this selling point that even with your collaborators, you are able to say, as a country, this is what are our priorities. So if you have to work with us, or if you need to work with us, this is where we need to focus. So most of the place, most of the time is that collaborators come and they, they kind of take the show or lead the show because they form their own research agenda. There is no any other national guidance that they have to follow. And therefore there is a very important role that national governments or national institutions have come up and say for us as a country or as an institution, this is what we'll focus. And therefore the collaborators have no much option but to buy into that. Then there is also another aspect that needs to be considered, especially for research capacity strengthening, is that we need to have the research embedded within the system, within the, 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 the programs. We have seen what our colleague from Mozambique uh, uh, highlighted. So not most of those activities, whether you are training healthcare workers or you are, you are generating evidence will happen if the systems, the health system is ignored, is, is not in the driving seat. So there is a deliberate requirement to embed, to embed the activities within the healthcare system. So if you are doing research capacity strengthening, you have to be careful or to be aware that who do you, are you training and for what purpose? So if you are not talking and listening to the healthcare system, then you'll be doing your own things and finally they say, oh, okay, you have trained several PhDs, several masters, but you actually don't need those kind of skills mix. We need another set. So you have wasted like five years and that's gone, that's opportunity lost. So in a, in, you need to therefore to have this uh, like basic requirements, structured and locally relevant. And there's always a need when you're talking about locally relevant to identify the most appropriate key stakeholders. For health, of course, the Ministry of Health is the key one, but we have seen that we have also looking for one health approach. So you might be doing health very well, but the other aspects or the other sectors that contribute to the outcomes you've ignored them. So One Health is also an important part that needs to be, uh, uh, to be considered. We have also the issue of individual versus institutions. Uh, there is capacity that you need to develop in individuals and also those that has to be developed or supported for institutions because you can have PhD holders, masters holders, but the local research and environment does not uh, Oga well with their skills. So these two have to be a, a balanced that you're not only de developing the research, I mean, the individual capacity, but also the institutional capacity. In creating awareness for opportunities is important, but also uh, being able to articulate what are the requirements for those opportunities. At times we just put opportunities, but then uh, they go out there and then nobody is aware that, oh, for this opportunity, the, the following are the requirements. And therefore it passes out or the, the, the actual uptake of those opportunities is less because the actual requirements were not uh, articulated adequately. Uh, I'm sure that, you know, this is what uh, Freddie mentioned at the beginning, this need for networking and also add mentoring this is something that is actually quite ignored in most settings, mentors and mentees. So there has to be pairs or twins that has to be put together so that we have people that can mentor the young ones. So if this is not properly articulated, then you will end up in some different, uh, uh, I mean, you'll have some less of the impact that you might need to have. We also need to have established community of practice. This is something that, you know, it's ongoing, it's encouraged, but most of the time it doesn't seem to, to work well, but it's a good training practice that you can put into place. And people that have been trained, for example, uh, Brenda can identify 
young, you know, university graduates that are going into that area, and then you form a group that she mentors, she established a community of practice, and therefore her skills get multiplied. You know, you have, as they say, you clone Brenda into several of them within Uganda, and that's what we are looking for. So we, and that's can only come if there is a deliberate attempt for networking, mentoring, and community of practice. Then, as we have seen during this COVID uh, uh, pandemic, that you need to have agile or adaptable platforms. So you need to continue to deliver the content, but also be careful that you, the quality and the quantity is what is expected. So it's not just delivering uh, your online virtual blended as they call it, or in place of face-to-face. -face. This platform must also have to have, must to deliver quality and quantity as expected. Uh, we also need to uh, continuously uh, expand the efforts that are already there. And how do we do that? Uh, TDR, as has been indicated earlier, is that it provides catalytic and galvanizing support. So TDR cannot take over from what the national government or institutions can do, but TDR provides some kind of a seed funding whereby individuals are supported, some, in some instances, the institutions are supported and therefore those institutions are supposed to take over over time and migrate from a project to a program, either funded locally by the governments or by their collaborators. And of course, as I, I don't, I, without any need to mention this, but it's important to note that TDR uh, responsibility is global, so you can imagine the, 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 this, how the, 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 the pie is sliced into all countries, especially in those uh, within the, the, the global south. So the Dr. funding... Amber, Dr. Amber, you have one minute to conclude. Okay, and I think that's what I, I'm going to conclude with. So all we need is to continue training and ensure that research and training go hand in hand. So you cannot do research without training, neither can you do re training without research. So they have to be paired and enable the development or the generation of evidence, generation and neutralization of evidence where it is needed most. Therefore, em embedding the activities, both training and research within the healthcare system. And with that, I'll stop there and we'll be happy to contribute later, but uh, thank you very much and uh, all the best to all the, the panelists and the attendees. Thank you, Freddie. Yes, I thank you very much, uh, Dr. Edward. Uh, again, if you're able to upload uh, the presenters on your Zoom, please do, otherwise uh, you can grab as, as a, a, a recognition for their efforts. Uh, Dr. Amberu, before I forget, I have uh, two questions for you that you'll address later. The first is uh, uh, the scope and breadth of uh, the initiatives at TDR in terms of uh, what, uh, in, if I'm a young researcher now looking for the opportunities, what is TDR currently offering, uh, particularly for, for the countries that are represented here, Uganda, Mozambique, uh, uh, and uh, Zimbabwe, and, uh, and of course, uh, where you are, Switzerland, and so on. Uh, the second is uh, collaboration from where you sit. What advice do you have about uh, collaboration within institutions, particularly when, when they are looking for opportunities like those offered by TDR? A case in point, uh, what do you usually uh, get when, when, when uh, several research teams in one institution, let's take a country, Wakanda, uh, apply for the same opportunity that is available globally. What, as, as a person who reviews this, what advice? Is it advisable that research groups within departments in one university compete at global level and so on and so forth? So we'll come back to that. Uh, uh, Dr. Brenda is back. Uh, as I said, we'll give her a chance to summarize her presentation. Uh, Dr. Brenda, in one minute, would you like to summarize your presentation? And then I'll, I will. I will present on behalf of Dr. Mutombo, who is not able to join, but uh, has shared these slides. And then we'll have uh, 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 questions and answers, starting with uh, 
Edward, the, the questions are presented, but also we have a number of questions in the Q&A. So Dr. Brenda, please, uh, one minute to summarize your presentation and then I will, I'll take the participants through uh, the slides of Dr. Mutombo. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And I would kindly request that you actually go to my last slide because I think that really gives uh, the biggest summary of what I wanted to say. But basically I wanted to highlight the different trainings that we have as an institution, both short and long-term. And uh, one of the clinical trials that currently we are busy with, which is the HPTN 084. Um, and this second last slide is looking to future slides, which we are glad include COVID-19 as well. And we have also our president now very much eager to have local efforts to develop a local vaccine as well. So all those are, are actually in place right now and we are participating in that. We are also excited about broadly neutralizing antibodies. Sorry, I think I have to get rid of one but it was a backup, <laughs> but even the backup of the backup failed last time. So anyway, uh, this is what I wanted to highlight, the fact that we were able to, uh, we are just preparing to do a study of broadly neutralizing antibodies for HIV, that's the C100 study. And then we are also very excited about being involved in COVID-19 uh, HIV, sorry, COVID-19 vaccine trials. So there's one under Sanofi and one under FHI 360 that we are, or both have already been submitted for regulatory review and we wait for approvals. My last slide, please, which really summarizes everything. So it's really to thank all these different people, but especially TDR, that is included there because TDR actually contributed to my postgraduate training, but also that training on clinical trial development was really very key for me. And I'm very glad it's good that uh, Dr. Mberu, you had commented about mentoring and mentoring is very key. And uh, this quote by Isaac Newton that I have been able to see further because of standing on the shoulders of giants. So my getting to this point has been because of mentorship. So I'm very eager to pay this forward by mentoring others. So the training that I went for in Belgium, one of our staff here at UVRI Ayavi is currently in Germany with the European Vaccine Initiative where she's undergoing the same training for a full year. She's been one of our medical officers here and has been heavily involved in clinical trials. And now she's going to get mentored into different areas of uh, management, as well as sourcing for funds and new partnerships. So that's something we are very excited about. The last thing I want to talk about is training for future capacity. And I want to invite all of you to look out for this clinical trials operation training which is again sponsored by TDR, but also the Gates Foundation. And it's training that is available online, we hope in November, through uh, a university in Ethiopia, but funded by TDR, funded by all those people that you saw there, and especially the Gates Foundation. So all of you who are involved in clinical trials, you have an opportunity to have your study coordinators train on different aspects of, of clinical trial management, right from your sites. They will have opportunity to engage with other researchers doing clinical trials within their country, but also outside their countries. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Brenda, for, for making uh, that comeback. Uh, uh, we, are, we are very pleased. I'll now take uh, just three minutes to, to talk about uh, one of the other presenters and then uh, we should end at 1.15, so I want to save time for, uh, for, for Q&A uh, so that we, we, are, we address some of the questions. Uh, our, 
presenter is uh, Dr. Mutombo, who is based in, uh, in uh, uh, DRC. Uh, he's also a beneficiary of the TDR uh, initiative, and I'll, I'll just introduce him and uh, some of the work that he has done. Uh, so he's currently a project coordinator, a uh, senior clinical manager at the DNDI in DRC, uh, and at that uh, institution, he heads the research and development uh, team. He led the team to monitor one of the clinical trials uh, to assess the efficacy of, of uh, Fexina Dazol administered to, to patients at all stages uh, treated on outpatient uh, basis. Uh, he's a member of the commission, uh, which worked on the transformation of the third direction, uh, which is a regulatory authority uh, into uh, the organization ACOREP, uh, which again, uh, focuses on regulation of pharmaceuticals as you see the, the, the full name in French. And uh, of course, it's, it has more autonomy, more power, and uh, hopefully uh, better functioning. <clears throat> so in terms of his work, uh, his interest, his <clears throat> he benefited from the TDR Clinical Research and Development Fellowship. Again, one of the opportunities, uh, I hope Edward will summarize for us uh, all of them so that we have a clearer view. And his work is based on uh, looking for treatments for, uh, for for trypanosomiasis, which is a neglected disease, human African trypanomyasis, which as we know in our setting is neglected and uh, uh, still affects uh, very many uh, uh, people in DRC in uh, parts of Uganda and other African countries. Uh, so with that, I will, I will end uh, this and then uh, we'll have uh, our sections. Of course, we express our gratitude to, to Dr. Mtombo for being so kind to share with us the slides, they'll be available as part of the, of the uh, World Health Summit uh, uh, report uh, for all of us who may want to, to have uh, 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 additional engagement and who will want to find out more information. So with that, uh, I will now uh, lay the ground for Q&A. And as I mentioned, we've had uh, presentations from uh, 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 from uh, Dr. Teresa Eduarda from Mozambique. We've had a presentation from Dr. Brenda uh, uh, in Uganda, Dr. Brenda Ketch, and then we've had uh, uh, Dr. Mberu, uh, who is uh, a WTDR. Uh, we have questions already. Uh, uh, we'll start with uh, Dr. Mberu. Uh, the two questions that I posed, uh, please uh, uh, take, uh, uh, just take a few minutes to, to summarize for us uh, uh, thank you. Dr. Edward, please. Thanks again, uh, Freddie, for the opportunity. And I think I'll make, make a very brief summary that currently TDR provides support to uh, seven universities in the low and middle income countries to, uh, uh, for in five regions, five of the six WHO regions. And these institutions provide master's program. And I think one does provide a PhD, but no longer a lot of funding for the PhD, but all of them provide master's focusing on implementation research. So most of them, of course, have their MPH, but then they have a, a, some kind of a, a tweaking to ensure that the MPH they are providing has a, more emphasis on implementation research. So these are six uh, universities, and I think I can list them. There's WITS in South Africa, Zambia, uh, then Ghana. Those are three in Africa. Then we have one in South America, in Colombia. Uh, and then we have two, one in Bangladesh, and the other one in Indonesia. We don't have anyone in any of the universities that we provision, but so far, those are the seven universities that provide masters for, uh, in, uh, that has some relevance in implementation research. In addition to that, we also have six regional training centers, which have been emphasized here by our colleague from Mozambique. It's a satellite for the Ghana uh, regional training center. Regional training centers provide short term courses that focus on uh, good research practices. So it can range as you've been indicated, good research uh, good clinical and laboratory research training, other methodologies uh, for research, including ethics, 
in implementation research. And currently the one in Ghana is running MOOC, the massive open online course on implementation research. We have also what I think uh, Freddie has already maybe can also share is sorted program. So it is short for Structured Operational Research and Training Initiative. This currently is focusing on um, antimicrobial resistance. It is a course going on at the moment for three African countries, Uganda, uh, Ghana, and Sierra Leone. Of course, this, the other regions have similar courses. As I said, this is a global activity that TDI engage, engages in. And then as uh, what um, uh, our colleague in DR Congo, Mutombo, and uh, Brenda indicated they participated in the Clinical Research and Development Fellowship. This is funded by, by uh, Bill Gates. It's currently in its last phase, and then we'll see how this moves forward. But the other courses, the other activities are funded by co-funding by TDR, so these are likely to proceed for a long time. But the Clinical Research and Development Fellowship might come to an end, I mean, as it is at the moment by the, the funding from Bill and Merinda Gates Foundation. And I Dr. think Ambero, I'll one stop minute, there. Mm -hmm. And then the other question, I think you did indicate about um, what we do. Yeah. Well, this happens quite often. I have just had one case last week. We put it back. If it's an from, for example, uh, uh, from Nimri, and then they have uh, same but competing um, applications, we put it back to them and ask them to organize their, to put the house in order. Because sometimes they are talking about different uh, study sites, different PIs, asking for the same kind of uh, budget but in the same institution, this we put back to them and ask them, we have received this from so and so, but we need to be more organized. They can you know, still be separate, but there are some areas that needs to be harmonized so that you, you, you don't duplicate. And of course, you also need that they talk to the same uh, language or the same uh, uh, area of work. If it's snake bites, then we need a more organized approach than an individual one. So I think this happens, but we get back to them and ask them to put their house in order. So I think I'll say that and uh, maybe uh, if anything, then later, but thanks a lot. Yes, I thank you very much, Mbero. Basically what I'm reading is that uh, generally if a university is applying for a grant, it's good that they, they, they go in as, as a single entity uh, in harmony and uh, with, with consistency. So before I forget, uh, uh, before uh, two minutes, uh, one minute before the end of the session, uh, we shall ask all speakers to turn on their, their videos so that uh, it can be captured in the virtual world. We will take uh, screenshots now. Uh, 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 now I will invite uh, one of the participants who has uh, uh, raised uh, 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 a question, but also uh, uh, he's not a beneficiary of TDR, but he can share uh, some of uh, of the lessons learned uh, in, in trying to build a research unit uh, basing on basically what we've, we've discussed. Uh, uh, Dr. Patrick Budrico, uh, you have uh, uh, two to three minutes uh, to uh, to just summarize. Uh, uh, we shall be cut off, so we, we, we need to really uh, stick to our time. Dr. Patrick, please, uh, uh, Jasper, I can, yeah, Dr. Nidoy, are you able to, enable Dr. Patrick uh, to speak is in the participants list. Okay, let me look for him. Patrick Budrico. I uh, thank you very much. Uh, so as we do that, uh, again, I uh, thank you very much uh, presenters for sharing this. Uh, the other point where I will ask uh, the panelists and participants to comment about is uh, uh, how uh, uh, some of the challenges have been uh, addressed, uh, challenges when you return to your institutions after getting a uh, 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 training uh, abroad. Uh, Patrick, I think you're now able to speak uh, and hopefully you can turn on your video as well. Uh, thank you very much, Fred. I think I can turn the video from here. It's uh, centrally controlled. 
Uh, please go ahead. You've muted yourself. Just go ahead and uh, give me Okay. Uh, I, I would like to thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Rodrigo is my name. I am a, a founding manager of Research Center for Tropical Diseases and Vector Control in the College of Vets in Makerere. I would And uh, I also do appreciate the challenges that uh, young African researchers do face. Uh, I being a product of uh, self-mentorship, I would like to add that in addition to what Dr. Edward has submitted, I think uh, there is a lot that uh, African universities need to do uh, to give opportunities and platform uh, for young researchers who go abroad to come back and settle. I think I started a lab in 2015. And uh, one of the motivation is that upon going to Japan, I realized the high-end labs uh, will just end where I went. And they, there is a high chance when I come back, there would be nowhere to start. So I started putting together a team of young uh, researchers around me and uh, put laid down a vision. I'm happy to note that uh, if you persist and also use networks that you have to gain into uh, support systems, it is easy to, to, to make it as a, a young researcher. And so we have to encourage peer-to-peer -peer, uh, mentorship amongst young uh, faculty uh, together with uh, providing platforms for mentorship by the senior, as Dr. Edward said. But also I believe there is need to uh, build uh, what we call a research tenure system in our universities because uh, it's, it's not enough to have a, a lecturer have much of his workload in, in, in teaching and then hoping he will be able to innovate. I, I have seen over time that it doesn't work. Too much workload in a class will take away your space for thinking, uh, creativity and innovation. But out there, uh, other universities develop parallel tenure system for researchers and they are only given 15% of their time to teach and share experience. That will allow mentorship of graduate students, uh, but also retaining them and getting opportunities for them to continue to work with you in your team. I also noted that- Dr. Uh, Dr. Patrick, you have one minute. Uh, oh, okay, thank you, Fred. The other aspect that we need to think about is the reward system. Um, well, there are all these young people who are trying in a very limited space. And uh, what support system does our institution build to be able to nurture their vision and their dream to be able to inspire the others? And uh, in a further discussion, I think uh, I would wish at one time to meet Dr. Edward to have a little more discussion with him, Fred, if you can um, link me to him. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and, uh, since we don't have much time, over to you, Fred. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Patrick Avodrico. Uh, uh, this uh, one of the main names of this uh, uh, health summit is, is to network and collaborate and continue the discussion with the aim of improving uh, our approach to addressing health challenges. Uh, right now, we are all faced uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic, but we know if we are to uh, to achieve the sustainable development goals by 2030. I remember we set them 10 years ago, with uh, 20 years ago in 2000. Uh, we are now uh, third way. Yeah, so we've, uh, we've, we've, we've basically used up 20 of the years. Uh, how, when we look, we look at our, our dashboard, how are we doing as countries? Uh, Teresa summarized for us how the TDR funded program is addressing that in Mozambique. Uh, uh, Brenda uh, uh, showed uh, what UVRI is doing, uh, Dr. Patrick has shared. As we leave this session, we need to ask ourselves, how are we moved towards achieving the sustainable development goals uh, with the capacity initiatives that TDR has put in place, but also with uh, the other opportunities that, that we've received. I'll now use one minute to summarize uh, before uh, the, the host of the session uh, uh, can, can take over. 
And there are basically three things. One of the things uh, I noted, uh, for instance, from the presentation from Dr. Teresa, uh, was that uh, language is, is important. So for instance, she emphasized that uh, they, they look to build capacity of Portuguese speaking uh, uh, institutions and countries. And then eventually, uh, they cross-pollinated their experiences and learnings uh, with Francophone and Anglophone. And she showed us very good numbers there. The other point it was about uh, collaborations. Uh, the third point was about uh, networking and uh, uh, communities of practice. Uh, as I mentioned, the session will automatically turn off at uh, quarter past one. Uh, so we, uh, we, we really have to, uh, to finish that. So uh, I will not give a, an I don't think we have time for panelists to uh, to make any comments, uh, but then I'm again very grateful. Thank you uh, to the panelists. Uh, uh, over to you, Jasper. You have uh, less than a minute uh, for any logistical administrative issues. Dr. Nidoy, please. Yes, I'd just like to thank all of our panelists and, and attendees who have joined us in this session.